We're here with Ed Levy at the Western Museum of Flight. You're from Northrop Grumman, aren't you? Yes, I am. Can you I tell am. us a little about your position and the warbirds behind us? Certainly. Um, I uh, manage a design group uh, at Northrop Grumman, uh, the integrated systems sector, and um, we design uh, sections of, of uh, airplanes, mostly uh, new experimental things, uh, as well as some, uh, some of the more advanced uh, portions of ships, because Northrop Grumman is in the ship business as well. The airplanes behind us are the YF-17 Cobra and the F-14 Tomcat. Uh, we're, uh, we're very proud of these. Uh, until fairly recently, they were in storage at uh, Northrop Grumman facility, who was kind enough to store these things for us. Uh, but now they're uh, uh, proud uh, members of the Western Museum of Flight exhibits. Can you tell us a little bit more about the YF-17? YF-17, uh, as the Y in front of its designation indicates, is a prototype airplane. It was originally developed back in the middle of the 1970s as um, uh, a, a competitor for the Air Force's uh, lightweight fighter program. The Air Force decided to select the F-16, uh, which is now a, a staple of the, of the Air Force inventory. However, the U.S. Navy really liked the the YF-17. Although uh, it was designed as a, as a lightweight fighter for the Air Force and uh, had the Navy of course has very different requirements, uh, there were many things about the airplane that the Navy liked and they selected it to be the prototype for their now uh, staple uh, F-A-18 fighter bomber. Can we have a closer up look? Certainly. Here we can see an example of how much lighter an Air Force uh, style landing gear is than the eventual Navy style landing gear that went on to the Navy conversion of this basic airframe. You can see here that this is really a rather delicate uh, mechanism. Uh, it experiences only fairly low landing loads relative to uh, what it would see uh, coming on board a Navy ship. So it goes from a very high speed to a stop position uh, over a long stretch of uh, paved runway. In the case of a Navy airplane, this would have to be much, much larger because, of course, it's going from well over 100 miles an hour to uh, zero speed in about 300 feet. So particularly this portion right in here, it's a bit difficult to see because there's also a steering mechanism. All of this is for steering the aircraft um, because we steer it, of course, by swiveling the nose wheel. But um, you can see that the actual portion of the cylinder that holds the piston that goes up and down here as the as the airplane uh, changes attitude on the on the surface um, that it's a it's fairly small it does not require a huge amount of hydraulic force to absorb the the landing force later on when you look at the landing gear on the F14 you'll see that it's a much more robust structure about twice the size or perhaps a bit more than that and here, by way of contrast with the YF-17 nose landing gear that we, we looked at earlier, we can really see how much more robust the F-14 Tomcat nose gear is. Uh, this landing gear, of course, has to take the very high forces that uh, occur when the airplane slams down onto the deck. The aircraft comes in at a high nose-high attitude. It catches the the uh, tail hook catches the wire and then the nose slams down onto the deck and all of that force has to be absorbed by this nose landing gear. So naturally it has to be a much, much more robust structure. Uh, very large hydraulic cylinder here with a large piston that takes up all of that extra force. It's one of the very major differences between a Navy style landing gear and an Air Force landing gear. One of the unique features of the YF-17, which has found its way uh, into all of the models of its successor aircraft, the Navy's F-A-18, is this leading edge extension. Structurally, this of course is part of the fuselage, but aerodynamically it's part of the wing. And that's why it's called the leading, leading edge extension, because it is really aerodynamically an extension of the leading edge of the wing. It was pioneered on the Northrop Grumman F-5 aircraft. Um, in some of the later models of the F-5, it was found desirable to modify the airframe so that it could operate at very high angles of attack, even at low speeds, and still 
uh, maintain controllability. Uh, this found its way into the YF-17, which was one of the f 5s successor airplanes, and now the F-A-18s, all of which you'll see on board Navy ships. Many of the things you might see in the news where uh, airplanes are flying off the Navy ships, most of those are F-A-18s, and all of those will have this very large leading edge extension of the wing that extends far up into the forward part of the fuselage. Here we have another interesting feature of the YF-17. Uh, as the Y in its designation indicates, it is a prototype, and as such, uh, it was built specially to be tested. Uh, one of the things that we require when testing an airplane is uh, to get a lot of uh, air data uh, as the aircraft is moving through the air. To do this, we have a tube that sticks out very, very far into the airstream. Now, we've removed most of it here, but you can see that the nose is specially uh, shaped to accept this long tube that, that sticks out in front of the airplane so that it gets out into clean air and picks up a lot of information about the ambient air and what's going on in it as the airplane moves through. That is only necessary for airplanes that we are testing. In production airplanes, we wouldn't have that long tube. So whenever you see a long tube like that sticking out in the front of the, an airplane, you can be pretty sure that it is specifically designed for testing. When we look at the F-14 a bit later, we'll see that the nose is uh, uh, tapered much more sharply and doesn't have the accommodation for this long pitot tube. At the end of the wingtip here, what we have is um, accommodation for a missile. The standard AIM-9 missile uh, is fitted to just about all American fighter planes. Uh, it's a heat-seeking missile. Now this, of course, is just a dummy missile, so we don't really have the little window on the front. But in an operational missile, this would have a window on it that picks up the heat signature of the target aircraft. It's an air-to-air -air missile uh, designed to, uh, to attack uh, um, opposing aircraft. Virtually all fighter planes and most attack airplanes have these either for offense or defense and uh, so it's the, the kind of the staple missile in the U.S. inventory. There are of course many wing stations, what we call wing stations uh, on uh, combat type airplanes. In most of the airplanes, certainly in the FE-18 as in the YF-17 here, uh, the wing stations can be used for multiple purposes. They can carry bombs, they can carry missiles for air-to-air -air or missiles for ground attack, or if necessary for long-range missions, they can also carry tanks. Uh, this fuel tank holds 330 gallons, and having one on each side of the aircraft really extends its range. So for uh, a strike where it has to take off from an aircraft carrier and go very far inland uh, to deliver its payload, uh, these tanks become very important, and they do extend the range. If we're just ferrying the airplane and it has to go a really long distance, many thousands of miles, of course, we can put uh, multiple tanks on the aircraft and, uh, and extend its ferry range. So there's a great deal of flexibility in both the mission payload and the mission range by using these external fuel tanks. Behind me here and up high, we can see the, the vertical tails of the aircraft. Uh, as you can see, there are two of them, and an interesting feature is that they are canted. They're not uh, perfectly vertical. Part of the reason for that is an aerodynamic requirement. We do have, as we spoke of before, the leading edge extension of the wing. And although it's a wonderful feature in terms of keeping the airplane controllable at high angles of attack, and generating a lot of lift that otherwise would not be available, they do cause a lot of buffeting. And that buffeting swirls around and uh, hits the vertical tail with a great deal of force. Uh, canting the verticals does help to remove some of that buffet uh, and uh, still keep the, the tails out in a smooth part of the airflow so that uh, you maintain full controllability and full effectiveness of those airfoils that are all important in maintaining the longitudinal stability of the aircraft in flight. Under the base of the wing, we see a feature of the YF-17 that it shares in common with virtually all modern combat aircraft, and that is the engine air inlet. The engines sit far back in the airframe, which is necessary in a combat airplane. Unlike an airliner, which doesn't have to go above uh, Mach 1, in other words, supersonic, the airliners can have their engines out on the wings where they pick up a nice smooth flow of air. With combat airplanes that have to go much faster, that would produce so much aerodynamic drag that they would not be able to achieve the speeds they need to achieve. That means that we have to specially design air inlets such as these, which can take the air that comes in with all of its turbulence from the airframe, 
smooth it out and present a nice smooth flow of air to the engine face. And that's why we see this special shape here. It's optimized for a particular flow of air. In this case, 161 pounds per second of air has to flow through this inlet. You also see a little grid here, which may be uh, slightly visible. It's a bunch of holes right in the side of the air inlet. And uh, the purpose of that is to allow any overpressure that, that gets created by turbulence here at the inlet, allow it to bleed off and uh, smooth out before it enters the inlet. Very, very important feature of any combat aircraft. Having looked at the vertical tail, which controls the longitudinal movement of the aircraft, uh, we also, of course, uh, don't want to forget the horizontal tail. In this case, it's what's called a flying tail. The entire horizontal surface uh, moves up and down, and that's what really controls the pitch of the aircraft. So if you need the nose to come up, the pilot will pull back on the stick, and this whole surface here will tilt downward, and that will cause the back of the airplane to go down, which pulls the nose up. Just the opposite, of course, he'll push the stick forward, and that causes the whole slab to uh, tilt backwards. And uh, it's what we call uh, uh, an, an elevator, but it's also a stabilator because it's the horizontal stabilizer and elevator all built into one. Now we also looked earlier at the engine inlet, and now we can see uh, the other end of the engine. And of course, a jet engine is really little more than a giant air pump. It sucks air in in the front, adds energy to it by burning fuel in the middle and compressing it, and then blows it out with that much greater amount of energy out the back. And because, of course, adding energy really means adding heat to it, uh, we have to accommodate that heat. And that is why these, what we call the turkey feathers in the back, are made out of uh, almost pure titanium and because you need that very special metal to be able to withstand the enormous temperatures that the airplane experiences from that engine jet exhaust.